No matter how great an actor might be, sometimes they're just not right for a part. Whether it's because they clash with the tone or the director's vision, what might have felt inspired at the time turns out to be a disaster. And it happens way more often than you think. For instance, did you know that Sylvester Stallone was originally set to star in Beverly Hills Cop? And what exactly happened with Edward Norton's recasting in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? We've got all the answers for you right here. Let's push off, shall we? We'll kick things off with an entry that's sure to confuse you. Because that's what we like to do here at Screen Rant. Confuse our viewers? So the first actor on our list would be none other than the Dark Knight himself, Christian Bale. And the movie he was fired from? That would be Mary Harron's American Psycho. See why this is confusing? Because didn't Christian Bale end up starring in American Psycho after all? You're absolutely right. What happened here was that Christian Bale was initially cast in the role of Patrick Bateman. But after Lionsgate acquired the film, they wanted to go with a bigger name like Edward Norton or Leonardo DiCaprio. According to Harron, she and the studio had a huge battle over the casting. According to her, they would have taken almost anybody over Christian. Conversations with Leo commenced, but it quickly became clear to Harron that he wasn't right for the part. Thankfully, he ended up running off to do The Beach with screenwriter Alex Garland and director Danny Boyle. This left the door open for Bale to return to the fold, and we are so happy he did. Seriously, can you imagine anyone else in this role? We certainly don't want to. And while we're on the topic of superheroes, let's take a look at what happened with Edward Norton and the Incredible Hulk. This is one recasting a large number of film fans still haven't gotten over. Sure, we love Mark Ruffalo. I mean, look at that face. How can you not love that face? But truth be told, we're still curious as to how Norton would have handled the dual role of Bruce Banner and the big mean and green rage monster. It's a shame we'll never know. So what exactly happened here? It all started with Marvel Studios issuing a statement that they were pursuing, and I quote, an actor who embodies the creativity and collaborative spirit of our other talented cast members. They went on to insist that money didn't play a part in their decision, but eh, who were they trying to kid, hmm? Allegedly, Norton had exerted a great amount of energy rewriting the Incredible Hulk script, trying to improve upon the material. This meddling must have left a bad taste in Marvel Studios' mouth, hence their decision to recast the role. Norton's representatives called Marvel Studios out, claiming the comments were offensive. They stated that Norton was genuinely excited about coming back for the Avengers. According to them, the negotiations had been civil. They could only conclude that Marvel Studios' decision not to go with Norton was based on money. Spike Jones, the director behind such films as Being John Malkovich, Adaptation, and Where the Wild Things Are, released a little film in 2013 called Her. Her starred Joaquin Phoenix as an awkward but lovable individual who ends up developing a romantic relationship with his personal AI played by Black Widow herself, Scarlett Johansson. It's a beautiful film, both hilarious and heartbreaking, often at the same time. If you haven't had the chance to check it out, we highly recommend it. Johansson's casting in the role of the AI Samantha is so perfect, you might be surprised to hear she wasn't the original actress who was cast in the role. In fact, it was Samantha Morton who had previously starred opposite Tom Cruise in Steven Spielberg's Minority Report. So why did Jones recast the role? According to a Q&A following a screening of the film, it was something he didn't realize until after production had wrapped. Jones stated, We got into editing, we realized what Samantha and I had done together wasn't working for what the character needed, and so we ended up having to recast at that point in time. While it's a shame to lose an actress as talented as Morton, this is another case where we can't imagine anyone other than Johansson in the role. Ah yes, Megan Fox. You remember her, right? Following her appearances in the Transformers films, Fox kind of, well, disappeared. I mean, she did movies like Jennifer's Body and those <clears throat> unfortunate live-action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies, but other than that, we haven't really seen her around a lot. What happened, Megan? Where are you? We think we can pinpoint the actress's disappearance to one film in particular. That would be the third Transformers movie, Dark of the Moon. If you recall, and if you choose to recall a movie like Transformers Dark of the Moon, we are so sorry, please seek help. But if you do recall, Fox wasn't actually in Transformers 3. Director Michael Bay removed her character from the film and cast model Rosie Huntington-Whiteley in a new role. What happened here? It's a case of Fox making some not-so-flattering comments about Bay's directorial style. According to Fox, Bay is like Napoleon, and he wants to create this insane, infamous madman reputation. 
that statement's not so bad, right? It gets worse. Fox went on to compare Bay to a very infamous dictator. Oof. That is a big oof. According to Bay, the franchise's executive producer Steven Spielberg told him to fire Fox right then and there. Judy Garland was one of the most beloved actresses in the history of all cinema. What's that? You don't know her name? I mean, we're showing you images and clips of her face, you must recognize her. Haven't you heard of a little film called The Wizard of Oz? You know the character Dorothy? Ah, yes, now you're getting it. Garland's rise and fall as an actress is one of Hollywood's great tragedies. Her career really took off in the early to mid-1930s with roles in films such as Pigskin Parade and Love Finds Andy Hardy. But, of course, it was her role in 1939's The Wizard of Oz that really shot her to superstardom. Life was never easy, though. Hollywood can be a cruel, cruel place, and she was constantly under studio pressure to change her looks and lose weight. She suffered numerous emotional breakdowns due to the number of medications she was on, as well as her failed relationships. She became emotionally and physically unstable, and as a result, movie studio MGM ended up dropping her from her contract. She was originally cast in Mark Robson's 1967 film Valley of the Dolls, but her personal struggles made it tough for her to succeed. According to actress Patty Duke, by the time Garland would get on set, she'd be so inebriated she couldn't function, hence the recasting. After a period of personal turmoil and controversy, Robert Downey Jr. finally cleaned up his act and started getting steady work again. By the time 2008's Iron Man rolled around, the guy was a bona fide movie star. And the rest, as they say, is history. Everyone wanted to work with the guy. And that included famed filmmaker Alfonso Cuaron, the director behind such films as Itumama Tambien and Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. And if anyone asks, yes, we still say Prisoner of Azkaban is the best of the Potter films. And you can quote us on that. In fact, Cuaron originally cast Downey Jr. as one of the leads in his 2013 film Gravity. Eventually, the role was recast with George Clooney replacing Downey Jr. But what prompted this decision? According to Cuaron, Downey Jr.'s more freewheeling, improvisational acting style just didn't mesh with the material or the technology they were going to be using. Each shot required impeccable timing and choreography, both behind the camera and in front of it. In an interview with Howard Stern, Downey Jr. confirmed as much. From his perspective, the amount of time it would take to set things up was just too much for him. If you haven't seen the live-action Paddington movies, you are missing out on one of the greatest gifts cinema has to offer humanity. Seriously, both of these films are absolutely delightful. They're full of heart and humor, and they're just gorgeous. Director Paul King and his creative team have crafted some truly stunning work here. You owe it to yourself to check out these cinematic gems. Get to it immediately. Go, go, go. One of the film's many, many highlights is Ben Winshaw's charming performance as the titular character. He instills Paddington with a warmth and genuine curiosity that makes the character incredibly endearing. But Winshaw wasn't the original choice to voice the character. Initially, it was famed British actor Colin Firth cast in the role. Firth seemed to understand from the get-go that he was wrong for the part. The bear needed a youthful energy and sense of wonder the veteran actor simply wasn't able to muster up. The film's producer, David Heyman, who was also behind that whole Harry Potter film series we're sure you've heard of, stated that Firth was the first to realize he needed to be recast. According to Heyman, Firth kept questioning if he was right for the part throughout the production. Turns out, Firth was right that he wasn't right for the part. Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. 40 years! You'd never guess it because the movie is so flippin' awesome and it feels so contemporary. It's also really flippin' weird. Like, really, really weird. But it's still great. We'll take it. Quick question. Should we use the word flippin' more often in our videos? Or is two flippins your limit? Let us know in the comments below. In Apocalypse Now's lead role, we have Martin Sheen, and he is superb but he wasn't the actor originally cast in the part of Captain Benjamin L. Willard. That's right, people. The actor originally cast as Captain Willard was none other than Harvey Keitel. Now, don't get us wrong. Keitel is a phenomenal performer. 
Just check him out in good old Marty Scorsese's Mean Streets or Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs. He's even amazing in his Pulp Fiction bit part. The guy is incredible. In fact, it was Keitel's performance in Mean Streets that originally won him the part in Coppola's film. The only problem? Keitel couldn't settle for being the passive onlooker the script demanded. After a mere three days of shooting, Keitel was back on a plane to LA and Sheen was on his way to pick up the part. And while Keitel would have surely been an interesting fit, we're gonna have to side with Mr. Coppola's decision on this one. Hold on a second. You're telling us that Jean-Claude Van Damme was originally cast in the movie Predator? And he didn't end up in the final product? How could this have happened? That movie is already so insane, but it would have been even more ridiculous and insane if Van Damme had actually been a part of it. Oh man, give us a second to recover. This is a loss that still hurts us deeply. Oh, wait, what's that? He wasn't actually gonna be playing one of the soldiers? He was gonna be playing the Predator itself? Wait, what? We need more information, please. So apparently, Van Damme was indeed cast in the role of the Predator. He even did costume tests and all that nonsense. According to makeup FX innovator Steve Johnson, Van Damme had to wear this ridiculously goofy red suit at the shooting locations. The reason for this was there was already so much green in the jungle, because, you know, it's a jungle. Red is the opposite of green on the color wheel, so it made it possible for the visual effects team to remove the predator from the scenes in which the creature is cloaked. Apparently, Van Damme thought the goofy red suit was going to be how the monster would appear in its final form on screen. He hated it so much, and he despised the fact that he would be spending most of the film as an invisible creature. He wanted to show off his mad martial arts skills. Oh well. There are plenty of things wrong with the two Matrix sequels, The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions. We don't have time to go into them now, but we trust you're already well aware of these faults. But perhaps one of the strangest and most glaring omissions from the two Matrix sequels was the character Tank. Portrayed by Marcus Chong, Tank was the lovable operator who worked with Neo, Morpheus, Trinity, and the rest of the Nebuchadnezzar crew. But the actor was jettisoned from the other movies. Why? Well, apparently, it's because Chong is kind of nuts. First and foremost, he made all kinds of insane demands for his salary. When those negotiations fell through, he took it pretty well. Oh, who are we kidding? No, he didn't. He actually called the filmmakers and producers, allegedly threatening them. It resulted in his being arrested in October of 2000. Tank disappeared from the films entirely. Instead, we had the character of Link, portrayed by Harold Perrineau. The Lord of the Rings is one of the greatest film trilogies of all time. Peter Jackson and his incredible team of filmmakers and creative artists crafted a remarkable epic that immediately wound up on the list of best film classics. One major factor to the film's success is the incredible cast. Elijah Wood, Sean Astin, Ian McKellen, freaking John Reese davies Everyone brings their A-game. Perhaps no one was as devoted as Aragorn himself, Viggo Mortensen. Mortensen committed himself to the role with incredible enthusiasm and dedication. He would frequently bring his sword home with him to practice with it. This actually led to an incident that nearly got him arrested when he was swinging it around on the streets of Wellington. You can't imagine anyone else in the role of Aragorn, right? Well, we're about to blow your mind because Mortensen wasn't the actor originally cast in the role. Jackson and company had initially cast Stuart Townsend, a young actor who appeared in such films as Queen of the Damned and The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Not long into the film's production, it became clear to Jackson and the rest of the creative team that Townsend was simply too young for the role. He was subsequently replaced by Mortensen. And while we're on the subject of Peter Jackson films, let's take a look at another recasting that occurred on one of his projects. That would be 2009's The Lovely Bones. Ah yes, that one. Alice Sibbald's beloved novel seemed to be in safe hands when it was announced that Jackson and the Lord of the Rings screenwriting team consisting of Fran Walsh and Philippa Boyens would be taken to Project Reigns. Sadly, the final product never soared the way fans hoped it would. The film was pretty heavily lambasted by critics and it struggled to make a profit at the box office. While Mark Wahlberg was ultimately cast in the role of the father, it was Ryan Gosling who was originally slated to play the part. We're pretty positive Gosling must feel he dodged a major catastrophe here, considering how poorly the film performed. But the story of why he was recast is pretty darn hilarious. Apparently, Gosling perceived the grieving father as a bit of an overweight slob. 
He gained a significant amount of weight, topping out at 210 pounds. No joke, he actually drank melted ice cream to hit this mark. The only problem was, he didn't discuss this look with Jackson beforehand, and Jackson was not impressed. Hence the recasting. But come on, Peter, how could you not be impressed by Gosling's dedication? The story of Back to the Future's recasting of Marty McFly is one for the ages. In fact, we're pretty sure you already know about it. Still, we'd be foolish not to include it on this list. To this day, it remains one of the craziest recasting stories in the history of Hollywood. So, in the role of Marty McFly, director Robert Zemeckis had originally cast Eric Stoltz. Up to this point in his career, Stoltz hadn't been in much other than Fast Times at Ridgemont High. To land this leading role must have been a major success for him. The only problem? He took it way too seriously. Apparently, he lacked the comedic finesse and timing that Zemeckis felt was so integral to Marty's character. Additionally, Stoltz was so intensely serious and devoted to the role, he actually went kind of method with it, Daniel Day-Lewis style. That is to say, he insisted that everyone on the crew call him Marty and even had issues getting along with Tom Wilson, who played Biff. Zemeckis had shot a significant amount of the movie with Stoltz when he realized he had made a casting mistake. With producer Steven Spielberg's support, Zemeckis recast the role with Michael J. Fox. The rest, as they say, is history. Boz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet is a pretty insane movie, full of Luhrmann's trademark energy and crazy visuals. It benefited from its lead actor's sincere performances. Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes' careers were practically launched to new heights by the film, which went on to gross nearly $200 million worldwide. But originally, it could have been another young actress's early big break. That would be Natalie Portman, who was the first pick for the role of Juliet. The only issue was that studio heads thought she looked too young for the part. Apparently, her love scenes with DiCaprio were labeled as creepy, and the part was quickly recast. It's too bad. Portman's career never really recovered. A couple of years later, she would go on to have a role in some movie called Star Wars, and she'd also end up winning an Oscar for her performance in Black Swan. What a shame. And finally, we have one of the most baffling recasting stories. You've heard of the movie Beverly Hills Cop, right? I mean, we mentioned it in the intro. It stars Eddie Murphy and still stands as one of the best action comedies out there. Believe it or not, the production had originally cast Sylvester Stallone as the lead character. Stallone kept rewriting the script so it would fit with his vision of what the character should be. He'd tone down the comedy elements and ramp up the drama. Eventually, he left the production to make the movie he really wanted Beverly Hills Cop to be, Cobra. We'd say Eddie Murphy got the better part of this deal, wouldn't you? There you have it, folks. What do you think? Do you think some of these movies would have benefited from their original castings? Are there any infamous recasting stories we might have missed? Let us know in the comments below. And be sure to subscribe to our channel so you can keep up with all the great content we're sending out daily.